Um, so before we move to our third panel, our third and last panel, I'd like to invite Carrie Ferguson um, uh, to provide a brief snap of of the of the learnings from the first session and the second session, the first panel and second panel. Sure thing. I hope you don't mind if I keep my screen, my my camera off because I can't see my my monitor if <laughs> if I oh, have the okay, other thing in the way. So yeah, for the first session there was so much. I wrote down everything everybody said, and so it was really hard to go back and and pick the most important things out. But um, one of the key, some of the key theme, themes for me that emerged from the experience were how ABCD approaches uh, contribute to empowerment, sustainability, motivation mobilization and resilience but it also is a tool to create that so it's a tool for empowerment sustainable sustainability motivation mobilization and and, and um, resil resilience so like it's it happens as a result of abc but then it's also a tool that you can re reuse to to create those things also how abcd contributes to collaboration building relationships, establishing trust, trust and community building. So it's like this sort of feedback loop that happens when you use ABCD and all these other things that have come out of it. So it's not just community mobilization, it's all these other sort of little offshoots that are occurring because of it. Um, and then that it, the communities were already using ABCD, but didn't realize it before. So I thought that's great because it's it's not just starting from ground zero. They already have some things they're doing and they can build on. So that was great that they realized that. Um, also that it was a, they, it seemed to be a process for the presenters on reevaluating and self-reflecting. So, you know, it, it was something that, um, so they used ABCD for instance, to create a program or initiative and then they kept on looking for ways that they can use it in other ways. So like going back, rethinking, looking at other ways that they could um, use it for different things. So for instance, on um, one of them was you, the, the organization that was that had all these training tools and they were assets, of course, but then when they looked at them differently, they realized that they could actually improve the community or improve the organization because they could leverage these assets for income. Um, again, relationships. And one thing I noticed was it changed the organizational perspective. So it was like a paradigm shift in that way. And again, reevaluating current practices and int introducing ABCD and looking how that can work. Um, the most significant thing I would say I found, I noticed here was how ABCD was redefining their work and how they looked at projects, programs, and approaches so differently. For example, again, already, like I said, about how you can build on assess assets and use them differently. And um, yeah, for, for future actions or questions that might be explored as a result of the session, I thought it would be interesting to collect stories on how ABCD has been used for sustainability and how that's been leveraged. And also how ABCD approaches can be used beyond the local community level, for instance, regionally or even nationally, and not just in like non-government organizations, in some other types of organizations, how big a map. And I, I think this is being done in some ways, but I don't think, I think it's just like at the community level where people go back and look at their how the community has been using it. They, they say, oh yeah, we're already doing this. But I think if you can apply, you can use some of the approaches and apply it to other organizations, or institutions or initiatives, then maybe there's something else that you can leverage from that. So that was mainly the first session. And honestly, the second session, it there was a lot of the very same themes. Um, so for instance, one of the things that I noticed was the empowerment that goes beyond in the individual level. So for instance, the women were being empowered because they could go out and they could make some money because they knew their children were safe and healthy but the benefits spread to the families and to the community. And it reminded me of a saying, I don't know if it's uh, a saying all around, but it says, uh, when you refer to something that's benefiting everybody, you, you refer to it as it's raising all ships. So in other words, everybody is benefiting from it. Also again, the paradigm shift, changing people's minds from waiting for funding to, to come to using their own assets. So uh, I thought that was really interesting. Like, again, there seems to be always a paradigm shift in this. It's like, people are like, oh, wow, that's, I didn't even think about that. And then when they do, it just flips everything. 
And finally, also the connections with TGMP and how knowledge is mobilized and shared on a number of topics, not just with it with TGMP, but others, and uh, not just business. And it reminded me of what we hear about women becoming financially and independent has been necessary, but not not, not sufficient in overcoming the burdens that disproportionately affect women. And so those are my my reflections from those two sessions. Um, thank you. Thank you, Carrie. So okay. our third panel is um, ABCD and Indigenous Cooperative Education. Um, and our panelists are uh, Pamela Standing, Trista Pelotisconias, and Carrie Lynn Paul. And uh, I'd like to invite uh, Krista Hanscombe, and she will moderate the the panel. Thank you so much. It's with you, Krista. Hello, Lynn Wellington. Well, what an amazing morning it's been listening to all these uh, I mean, these stories coming out of community and asset-based um, uh, methods. I'm looking forward to this next conversation. So glad that you could all could join us. So today we have Pamela Standing, Trista Pawambasconis, and Carrie Lynn Paul, who are very excited to share their perspectives with us on Indigenous cooperative education and asset-based community-driven development. So first, I'm going to share just a brief bio for each panelist, and then I'd like to invite them to int introduce themselves in the way that's the most meaningful for them. So first is Pamela Standing. Pamela Standing is the co-executive director of programs and partnerships at the Minnesota Indigenous Business Alliance. She is a proud member of the Cherokee Nation and brings her expertise in international business and organizational transformation to the realm of Indigenous cooperative development. Pamela is also an alum of Cody's asset-based community-driven development course, and she earned her certificate in winter 2023. Pamela? Ile and I just welcome everyone and I say hello to everyone together and in my for my with my name and Anuete Inole and I'm really happy to be here today and I offered prayers this morning for everyone that was attending for all of us to have good thoughts our ears are open our hearts are open our minds are open and um, that our families have life and they have what they need to live in a good way. Thank you. Wado. Well, all and Pamela, and welcome. Next is Trista Pawapaskonis, um, and she can correct my pronunciation. Uh, Trista is of Little Pine First Nation. She is the Indigenous Relations Lead at Cooperatives First. With an MBA and diverse experience guiding Indigenous startups, Trista is a lighthouse for communities navigating the complex waters of cooperative business planning. Trista is an alum of Cody's Circle of Abundance course, Indigenous Women in Leadership, and Building on Abundance in Indigenous Communities. Trista? Tanze, uh, uh, thank you for inviting me here to speak today. I'm really excited. Uh, also, just to connect and see everybody again, and um, once again, just thank you, uh, and I hope you enjoy the, <laughs> the presentation. So. Hmm. Well, I'll interest it. It's really good to see you again. And last, but certainly not least, uh, Carrie Lynn Paul, who is my amazing team member, is Listigoy Adult Educator from Woodstock First Nation. She's deeply involved in Indigenous education and community leadership. She teaches in the Indigenous programs with the Circle of Abundance at the Cody International Institute and has over 15 years of experience in Indigenous adult education and community leadership. Carrie Lynn? Dungok, Nildali was Gizustan. In my language, I just said, um, it's a good day. My name is, um, my, my spare name is um, Sunflower. Uh, my English name is Carrie Lynn. I'm super excited to be here with these lovely women. 
Um, like Krista said, I come from Woodstock First Nation. I grew up on my mom's in my mom's community. Both my grandmothers, however, come from uh, Tobik in New Brunswick. Um, I'm so happy to have heard um, the speakers before us, and um, I want to thank Krista especially for opening a, opening the whole session, all three sessions, in a good way. So thanks. Mm -hmm. I will. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our uh, what we're going to cover today in the session. So we've really tried to set up the session as a um, storytelling with a storytelling approach. Um, and so we're going to first unpack what ABCD is and uh, what we how we define Indigenous cooperative education. We're going to talk about that spark. What was that spark that started um, this work or this collaboration? Uh, we're going to go over a couple of examples um, of Indigenous cooperatives. Um, and then we're also going to talk about um, some of the impacts and the benefits that we've seen, um, as well as some of those challenges. You know, what are those lessons that we learned through the whole process? And then Chris is going to um, take us home with um, some a question and answer period. So hopefully uh, that will cover a lot of the questions that you have. I think first I want to talk about um, kind of how I uh, in my work and our and my colleagues, um, Krista included, um, talk about um, ABCD from an Indigenous perspective. We call it actually building on abundance in Indigenous community. And I think that that uh, idea of building on abundance is is a really key factor in um, in our work, and it's really a strategy for us to focus on. Um, our community strengths and assets rather than our deficits and that that um, and scarcity. So we're we're flipping that on its head and we're and we're trying to explore and up, uplift each other and each other's stories and gifts um, through that process. I think we took the best of ABCD, the ABCD approach, whether it was that rejection of the deficit model um, and really helping move away from being defined by those um, by those deficits and being driven by that fear fear and scarcity, um, we've really taken community expertise and put it at the center. That you know, encouraging people to think of themselves as enough and having enough, um, and that they are the experts in in this process. Um, you know that it's. I think it's been. Um, important also for us to encourage autonomy and self-determination. Um, part of what we're going to talk about is is the, sometimes that struggle, that inner struggle of, of changing our own mindsets and our own lens of, of, of seeing our, our gifts and assets. Um, you know, really building on that, that authentic leadership and trust in communities because through colonization, we've lost a lot of that. That's been interrupted by that process. Um, and then the you know ABCD being an approach that's really flexible and adaptable that's really important when working in our communities, and I think the I think the ABCD as an approach has just helped us validate the experiences of many of our of the people in our communities, and so um, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Pamela and Trista to get us started on answering the question of what is indig indigenous cooperative education. Okay. Um, I'll start. <laughs> um, so I work for a nonprofit organization, Cooperatives First, and we were developed. Uh, we actually came out of a research project at the University of Saskatchewan, uh, and it was uh, the research project was a cooperative innovation project, and it was actually to um, funded by um, the Center of Cooperative Studies and the Federated Co-op uh, to really look at whether or not the co-op model is still relevant, uh, especially in Western Canada, and if uh, are people still willing to partake in co-op uh, co-ops, and why hasn't there been a growth? So throughout this research project, they found that uh, both rural and Indigenous communities 
are still interested in finding community solutions and access to services and working together in a collaborative effort. Uh, the reason why there hasn't been a growth in co-ops co uh, was the lack of um, awareness of the model itself. Um, many education institutions and like business courses do not explain what cooperatives are. They usually go through the other business models. Um, and then there's also the lack of support and guidance throughout creating a cooperative. So Cooperatives First was created to address those issues. Uh, I the Our organization started in 2016. I started in 2018 and I started working as a business um, development lead to help a people get business ready, <laughs> um, investment ready. But then there was the, the awareness and the training. So I had colleagues who were community engagement um, leads who would actually go out to the communities. But the way that it was portrayed was with bringing in um, a very colonized approach, a westernized approach, uh, non-Indigenous examples, and very technical and um, it didn't really include indigenous perspectives including like the seven co-op principles and having um, these instilled and many co-op developers really still use that colonized approach so for the co-op education that uh, we'll kind of go through a little bit later is really putting the communities first and the Indigenous perspectives first. Um, Pamela? <laughs> oh. One of the things that um, we really looked at as we took that, uh, that kind of Eurocentric cooperative model and we just turned it upside down and we knew what inside we knew what works best in our communities it was about what we have to do and everything is about relationships in our communities it's about building trust it's about being a person that when you say something people know that you're going to follow through that you're good for your word and um what I, my experience working with both Trista and Carrie Lynn, what I loved, because I've always felt this when I was teaching classes at the tribal college, even with grant making, I said, don't lead with what's wrong, lead with what's right. We have so many good things happening. We have so many good people in our communities. And we're always put into this philanthropic hunger games, you know, to get money. And, um, you know, you have to be the poorest, most pitiful. And so we've, we've just through our own experience, you know, and myself, I can't speak for others that I did have a scarcity mindset. And so, you know, when I looked around at everything that the creator has provided us, you know, I think us just a little kernel of corn, you put that in the ground, it grows a plant that sometimes has eight to 10 ears on it. That's abundance. That's the environment that we live in. That's the natural world that we live in. So it's been very exciting to start from that place to, to start with community first, relationships and building trust. Trista, I'll hand it back to you. So the reason <laughs> um, I think both Powell and I, like once we actually met and connected through um, and were able to sit down and really talk about co-op education. And um, for myself being very new to the co-op sector, when I first started, I came in to, to be more of like, we need a marketing plan, we need the financial statements, we need the operational plan. So I didn't come at it as like the cooperative itself, but working um, and attending 
community events with my colleagues, it was that familiarity um, with the audience and seeing like um, they would not ask questions, but then after the presentation, I'd, I'd be standing off to the side. Um, I'd have community members coming to uh, to talk to me and tell me what's kind of really going on and how they're about their communities. Um, one of the things that I've seen not only within um, my organization, but other organizations at the start where uh, people talking about these seven co-op principles and uh, there is a, a great person who did a, a research study and she molded how co-op values and Indigenous values um, are connected and are the same, which um, I, I think that there are very good complementary values in both of them. However, our nations are complex, but there's such diversity even within our communities and the tribes throughout um, Turtle Island that there's different value systems, there's different experiences, um, there's different perspectives. And so it was really important to continue going forward um, by putting the individual community first and not using a pan-Indigenous approach. Pamela? For me, it has been just a constant learning and growing experience. And I, you know, um, we had our first cooperative um, on Cherokee Nation, the Native Women's Cooperative. We, we started that in, oh, it was in the mid 90s. And um, we had no technical assistance. We formed it as more of a collective. We were never a formal cooperative. We ran that for like 10 years. I'm surprised we kept it going as long as we did. It was all volunteer. And, but we really helped our artists in the community, but we were lacking some of the technical things and even that infrastructure of building abundance and, and asset mapping would have been such an invaluable tool for the work that we were doing. And we would have probably even brought more women into the cooperative just because of the nature of that practice. And, um, you know, it, what I love is we just have a way of doing things so well in our communities. And we have such brilliant minds. We always say that the creator gave us such cr creative minds and this brilliance and, and loyalty. Those are our gifts that we come with, you know, and we use those things to help our communities. And for me, it's been about, it's been such a growing journey because when I first really started researching cooperatives in uh, native communities in the US and, Can and I also contacted cooperatives up in Canada, I was still looking at it through that Western lens. And um, and I the first publication we did, it was really based on that cooperative model. And I was being, the people I were going to, that was how they knew how to do this. And so when we did the second uh, building uh, communities, uh, cooperative communities and indigenous communities, um, I remember the gentleman that I was working with, he, he read the publication and he said, I don't understand this. And I said, well, it's not meant for you to understand. It's meant for our people. They're going to resonate what is written in here because it speaks to who they are. And um, we're not writing it for the for Western society. We're writing this. This is our gift to our communities. And so it was a real different way. But also in my own learning, and, and Trista was the one, we had used that overlay and um you know, and she talked about that being a real pan-Indian approach. And it was a real eye-opener for me because I do know that our communities are very distinctly different. And I just thought that was such a beautiful model. And I thought, oh, well, it was written by Native people. 
Well, I found out it wasn't. And here I was using it. And I feel really bad. You know, I've had to apologize to people, you know, that I it was I was naive in what I was doing. And I had gotten permission to pub republish it and adapt it in our book. So it's a it's really a growing process. And that's what's wonderful about being alive is that we have the opportunity to meet our communities where they're at and listen to them and work with them and let them be a co-creator and be a partner in that process with them and their voice. And when they see the opportunity, we can just be there to walk alongside them and help them. So that's what I really love about this model that we're using. Okay, um, so when we're talking about this bark and realizing that like the ABC D approach and uh, the building on abundance approach might fit well within cooperative values, um, it really did take a lot of time um, for me to, to bring it all in and um, kind of formulate uh, but when you actually look back to uh, the communities themselves and what cooperatives are, and um, you think of initiatives that are held on communities uh, when there is a tragic event or like a loss of somebody or even a, like a celebration, people are not doing this alone. It is a community effort. People are there to support. And it's seeing this within when um, people take on their own roles. They know their own roles. They know where they're good at. All of a sudden, you'll see like the same group of people um, cooking and gathering. And there'll be some within the community going out to talk to the elders like everybody has their own role and they all bring those gifts into whatever event or whatever is happening to support each other um and that i so that um drive to to work together it has already been there so to use that as a cooperative example, it, we're not trying to say this is a co-op and you have to fit um, what you want to do into our agenda and the way we, we, we think that you should have it. Um, you are now like the person in charge of communications. You are now in charge of administration. No, everybody comes together um, automatically. And if you're trying to put an external system um, onto a community um, that people are not comfortable with that role, the co-op will, really will not survive. Um, I don't feel that it's my place when I'm working within a community for co-op development for me to assign those roles. They should come naturally. And um, many people already are aware of their gifts, just not really willing to uh, outright tell it because, yeah, uh, humility is still one of the sacred teachings in our, in our culture. The spark for me when I realized that this approach would really fit well in cooperative uh, training and education was uh, we were, uh, Trista was partnering with us in Canada, in the US, we had, um, we started a native community cooperative developers training. And we launched the first 10 sessions. We're in, um, we're in phase two right now, we plan to have five phases. And, but we want to have native cooperative developers. We want to have a lot of native cooperative developers that can go in and work in the, not only their own communities, but 
neighboring communities and you know they can really be an asset you know when they come in there because they're coming in with a different frame and when we started this curricula i really got stuck and it was a woman that um with the cooperative development foundation mary griffin she was just such an advocate and she said um she said you can do this any way you want this is your program you do it how you want to and and it was like Gee, I what I wanted to do is I wanted to start at building relationships and trust. That's where I saw that as Native people, that's where we need to go. And I took, I attended over three years um, at the University of Madison in Wisconsin, Cooperative Works, Cooperative Developer Training. And there was nothing in there that I could take and bring back to my community. There was, there was nothing in there that I could adapt. And it didn't talk about relationships. It didn't talk about trust. It, it missed so many opportunities. And so then I spoke with Trista and um, we brought in Carrie Lynn uh, Paul to help us. And she uh, led the training and it was such an aha moment um, because it really spoke to who we are as a people. And um and what really touched me was watching the people that the 15 people that were selected to be a part of this kind of launch, uh, th this cohort launch, just hear their comments, how they felt. They felt like they were being affirmed as people, as indigenous people. It felt, it just felt good to them in their hearts. And, um, you know, and when I saw people even looking at their own communities with a new lens and all of a sudden seeing their community differently, it was so beautiful. So that was really where I got the spark that we were, this is the, we're doing the right thing. And it's really grounded in relationships and trust. It's grounded in abundance. It's grounded in spirit. It's grounded in letting our people lead because we know they know. And it's grounded in acknowledging the gifts that our community people come with, that they come to the table with. And it's about, it's it's also building capacity and helping people feel confident about those gifts because we're taught that the creator gives us gifts. We carry those from when we come into this life. And part of our job is to know how we're supposed to use those gifts in a good way to help other people, to know what that purpose is, how do we use those in a good way. And so this, this way of doing it allows people to really see how they can navigate in their community and how they can share their gift and really use it and, and to the benefit of other people. And, and make their community a better place to be. So when we started with uh, like Indigenous cooperative training, um, it was really important uh, for, for myself and for others to really set it in a tone that impacted the people who are going to be benefit benefited from so within our um cooperative uh, cooperatives first in our approach and knowing that it is the members um cooperatives are created to benefit the members um they're in indigenous <laughs> economic development most times um People at the grassroots level do not see initiatives like firsthand and seeing it. But having people within the grassroots being a part of something, to have that an initiative and having that pride in this operation. So I um like I really think back to having people and knowing their gifts and their skills for this community benefit. Uh, I'm recalling like a story that happened a few years ago, early in, uh, during the pandemic. Um, this happened at uh, my home community and that there is a group of women, um, four women within the community that 
uh, knew that there were elders in the community that used to drive uh, to the nearest town, which is like about 13 kilometers away, um, to get their meals. They did not cook. They couldn't, um, they, they could not cook. They uh, just found it easier for them to drive uh, that distance. And then they could talk to each other, meet each other, and then have that um, social, uh, socializing there. But with the lockdown, they were not allowed to leave the reserve and many times not even leave their own property. And so for concern of these elders, these four women took whatever food and resources they had within their own kitchens and cooked meals and had one person delivering them house to house to all the elders to ensure that they were being fed. Um, because of the lockdown and not being able to leave the, the reserve themselves, um, the community would send yeah, 10, uh, 10 pound sacks of potatoes and roasts to every household to, to feed and to ensure that everybody was being fed. But for the elders that didn't cook, uh, what were they going to do with that? So the women actually just used their own personal rations to, to feed elders. And as they were going on, a few of them actually worked within the school and were uh, cooks for their hot lunch program. And knew that there were some students in the community that their only meal was at the school and that the lunch program took care of uh, the meals. So they wanted to include the children. Uh, so they packed lunches and created like made lunches and wanted to feed the community. They did it volunteer work. They did not get paid to do this work. They did it for concern of others. Um, as time went on, leadership did find out uh, about what the initiatives the women were doing and then provided them with more rations because they knew they weren't keeping them themselves but sharing with others. Um, so these women, like after lockdown ended, they took their skills and actually purchased a food truck and yet yeah, there are vendors at like POWs and special events because they came together um, in this way, but then wanted to continue cooking for others. Um, so, and like all of them had their, their, their gifts. So yeah, the organizing, um, you know, as some of them were working at the school, they had their safe food handling. So like they were able to bring their gifts and just work together and it wasn't like a big planned initiative but it was just something that needed to be done Pamela? when i was listening to your story trista there there's two things that came to mind is we have this word in our language i just i love it it's called gadugi and it means it's like a call to action. Like if, if somebody's house burns down, the community comes together, someone brings wood, the women bring blankets, they bring baskets, they, bring, they cook food and they set it all up outside and the men work to do construction and, you know, to help each other when we have a crisis. And um, I know during COVID, we saw so many beautiful examples of how we came together as communities to really care for one another in a very difficult time. And the other word that I was thinking of, it's a word that we kind of, we kind of make up words and we call it, we don't say entrepreneur, we say indigipreneur. And, and our definition of that, it's a verb, it's action. And it's a person that sees an opportunity in their community to make a better way, a better life for themselves, their family and their community. And um, I just love that because it, you know, those women the, here, they helped everybody and then they made a, they made something for themselves, you know, to, to go forward, you know, they came together. Um, the example that I would like to share is it's, uh, it, it's the White Corn Cooperative. Uh, they're located on the Oneida Nation in Wisconsin. And when they came together, part of the reason was, is that they wanted to, um, this is what I see about cooperatives in our communities, because 
we're not just looking at a business. We're looking at healing, healing from trauma, from loss of language, loss of culture. We're, we, these are things that we're doing as a cooperative. So we're very holistic in our approach, you know, the whole person. And um, the White Corn Cooperative, it was a group of women that came together and they wanted to they wanted to bring those matriarchal teachings back about the corn and growing the corn. And this is their Indian corn that they grow. So they still call it that. And so when they started their co-op, they didn't want to, um, they did not want to incorporate under state law and their tribe did not have a uh, cooperative law established in their courts. So they went ahead and they incorporated as an LLC there is absolutely no money that changes hands in this group. But what they've figured out over the years now that they've been together, it takes 56 hours of labor from putting that seed in the ground, getting the soil ready, all of the things they have to do to get the soil ready just to put that seed in the ground, then tend to it as it grows and weed it and take care of it and protect it from flooding and climate change. And then to the harvest, to the drying, to the actual um, grinding of the corn. And um, it takes 56 hours of labor to grow one pound of their white corn. And so every member, they're really strict. I mean, I think they're stricter than some of the cooperatives that I've met. You have to clock in your hours. And so if you don't work a lot of hours, you get very little corn. But people see the value of, if I work hard, I get a lot of corn that I can bring back to my family. We can have it all year long and have our traditional foods and our meals. They can trade it with other people for things that they need. And so that's a way that they've used an indigenous worldview for trade and exchange. And um, that's how they're handling their transactions with the corn. The corn is their, is like their dollar that they're exchanging or it's their, you know, item that they're selling in their cooperative. So, but they trade with people and they also uh, set corn back to feed the elders. So I just saw a picture of what they had done. Um, they, they just got done with their harvest and getting everything taken care of and the corn, they had bags of corn that was set aside for the elders in the community. And the other piece that I this example that I think is really beautiful is they have influenced Native Nation policy, you know, within their tribal government, um, their tribe now, because a lot of our a lot of our reservations are traditional jurisdictional land, it's we call it checkerboarded. So it's not all owned by the tribe, because just a lot of things happened. And I don't want to go into that. But they lease land and they've been leasing it to white farmers. So what they do now is all of the land that the tribe is over in their jurisdiction, they now give first option to any of the cooperative members that want to grow corn. And the other thing that they've done is they've changed the way that they grow their corn in response to climate change. So it's really interesting how they're using that indigenous mind to see these issues around them and they're responding to those risks and so it's really you know I, I think it's a beautiful example thank you I'm going to add in because the first example I did give was not technically a cooperative but I did work with a group of um, out in British Columbia called the Udnau Urban Indigenous uh, Cooperative and when we met with uh, this Udnau uh, cooperative, they are actually a group of uh, curriculum developers. And each one had different skills and knowledge and experience. So this is shortly after I did take the building on an uh, abundance course so I, I I wanted to to work with within the group and just hear about what each member is bringing and you know their overall vision so there is a former social worker there's a an educator there's uh, somebody who's 
very experienced and has a wealth of knowledge in Indigenous governance and government policy. Um, and they had all been working on individual contracts and working as individual contractors. But working individually um, does have its challenges and they wanted to work together, uh, not only for personal um, branding and being able to be easier to find for the communities in which they work, where they do take a community approach and a Indigenous approach to get uh, within the collaboration and the um, community, like they go right into the communities and um, hear back and develop these organizational plans for for each community or organization that they're working with. But um, receiving health benefits, receiving like group benefits and being able to to do those for their own personal well-being, but also to pool whatever revenue they have and being able to give back and make a larger contribution to Indigenous communities in which they're working with. Because although they are making a living for providing a service from these communities, they also want a way to give back and thank the communities uh, in a larger way. Thank you both for those stories. I'll pass it to Pamela to start us off with the impacts and benefits. One of the, I saw, you know, the, the impacts and benefits, and sometimes I call it unintended impacts that maybe we weren't thinking of was going to happen. And we saw it emerge, you know, through the training. One of the greatest things that I saw was when people had that aha moment. And all of a sudden, they're looking at their community in a totally different, like before, all they could see were the things that were wrong or what they were lacking, what they needed, what they didn't have there. And they were looking at their community with all of the abundance of resources, infrastructure, um, the, the gifts, uh, the, the associations, the institutions, the organizations that are all part of that territory where they are, but also on the border of their territory and looking at how can we bring those people in to partner. But I feel like one of the greatest things that I've seen is where people are really, it's kind of like stepping into their own light because they're feeling confident and they're embracing the gifts that they have and they're not embarrassed. And it was, you know, it was something that Trista shared, and I'll, I'll always hold this teaching. One of the things that we have to do is when people share knowledge with us, um, I, I kind of call it um, cultural footnoting, <laughs> you know, it's but it's oral, and it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, we're standing on other people's shoulders. None of us are here by ourselves. We're here because... Our grandparents and our great grandparents, they prayed for us to have life and have a better life. And so we have a great responsibility and we, you know, we learn from other people. We come with our gifts, but other people share with us. And Trista really talked about, it was something that really moved me and I'll always keep it really close to my heart about, you know, it's not about bragging. It's something that you really have. It's an experience you have. It's not something you read in a book. It's something that you live with every day of your life. But the part that I thought was so beautiful was she said, that's a part of our bundle that we carry. That's those good things that we give. It's that medicine that we have, that we share and help other people have a better life. And that's what I saw happen with the group. I saw people, they were really shy about who they are. And then all of a sudden, I saw them get, they were more confident. And so to me, that was a big, big impact and a huge benefit to the work because they're going to bring that experience because we learn through experience. They're going to bring that to their work wherever they go. And for that, I, I 
is something that I really saw of great value of the work that we did together. Krista? Well, I think it's I think it's me. <laughs> um, I think one of the one of the uh, benefits that I I um, experienced as being part of this group, um, being invited into this group of women. I think strong women. Um, one of us is missing, Bijiba. Um, you know, I saw the kind of the four of us as a community of practice, and so being able to come to the group with um, challenges or not knowing kind of what the next steps are. Um, for curriculum or whatever the challenge was, whether it was in my work or whether it was part of the teaching and, and facilitating. Um, I think we've continued to share and uplift each other's work. Um, and I think we've also given each other opportunities. I've been blessed to have Trista come and co-facilitate the Building on Abundance in Indigenous Communities course um, this, in, this fall. Um, and I also think that that um uh me as a learner like pam was saying you know she's a learner but supporting each other by gently reminding us to take uh to keep that lens of abundance um stay in that abundant space and um because i need that even though you know um i teach this it's i'm still a learner too and so having those um that group of women uh or a group of practitioners that are that are willing to help me move the work forward um, and give feedback. It's, it's, it's been a benefit, um, I think, that, that I have seen. Um, Trista, I'll pass it over to you. <laughs> and um, like doing this type of work and starting something new, like there, there, it does come with like a host, <laughs> some challenges. And I think the biggest one that I found um, within this work within indigenous uh, cooperatives and education is changing people's mindsets um early on um talking about hu humility and that is one of the teachings is not to brag and so people also um don't want to feel like they're bragging and um keeping their gifts uh but to being able to bring out that confidence and knowing that there is a difference between like, like the arrogance and being confident and being able to show, you know, the gifts that they truly have. Um, and then there's also the, the mindset is like the structure that was put upon um, First Nations communities within Canada was like the very, um, Patri like um, patriarchal approach or where you have to ask permission for everything including like the past system or like even hunting and you know the, there were so many restrictions that it was always uh, people got used to having to ask permission or looked for leadership like once those uh, came down was um, and realizing that it is up to the people um, and the grassroots people like we have the opportunity and people have to be the um they they have to feel like that they are the agency they have to be the ones to make the change and they can do it and they have the power and they have the knowledge it's just breaking it out and seeing everything that they can use and they have available to them to be that um that change within their communities. Um, okay, so lessons learned. So there, there are quite a few <laughs> lessons that I've learned like personally. Um, I'm like, I'll echo the statements of uh, Carrie Lynn and Pamela is like, I am a lifelong learner. I will make mistakes but one of the things and the impacts is like coming in being genuine with within the group and them knowing that I am doing my best and I'm learning and we are really building from each other um, and what we're doing within cohorts or client work that I'm doing 
is we are building these things and sharing and being able to to bring whatever gifts we have. Um, I am fortunate, like I believe that um, using the the term like the education is the new buffalo. But when you're using that term, um, thinking back to when we did have buffalo, if somebody did um, was able to hunt and was successful in hunting and, and got a buffalo, they did not hoard it. They did not um, keep it to themselves. They did not show it off and just say, look at me, I have, I can eat. And seeing people within their own community um, not benefiting from that. So I truly believe that when we are doing this cooperative education, that it is meant to be shared. It is meant to grow and see our communities thrive and use whatever knowledge that they're learning to continue on and supporting each other in uh, community development. Uh, Pamela? Yes. I was also something else that lesson learned about um, th there isn't a handbook with this. And so you're creating it as you're working with a community. And, you know, when you come from like graduate school and, you, you know, all these things where you do research and it's like, where's the manual? Come on, I need a big book, you guys, so I can put, you know, have that out. And I'm old school teacher. And so... Um, that's been really interesting, but what I love about it, it breathes and it allows you to adapt, to pivot and to be flexible, to address the particular needs of the community. So that's one thing that I saw that I love about this um, ABCD and the building abundance in our indigenous communities is that flexibility and adaptability that we can we can work with any community and we can customize it for what they need and to help and um and or what opportunity they're looking you know that they're seeking to uh, accomplish together one of the challenges for me is lessons learned is self care and i think as women all of us as women and um we tend, you know, we're, we're used to spinning a lot of plates. We're feeding children. We're, you know, taking care of our parents, our relatives. We're responding to things in the community. And that self-care is so critical. So um, that's uh, something that I know that we have to be aware of. And I have to be aware of constantly. And Wado, thank you so much. Um. There was a few other things that we talked about in our discussion in preparation for this. And one of those kind of lessons learned that we agreed on was that don't rush it. Um, you know, relationship building is a slow process and it's going to take time to build that trust. Not that we can't move forward um, as we build trust, but take the time to do that and value that. Um, uh, doing things in person, you know, we had some online sessions before we did an in-person session. And I really think the the ABCD approach um, was grasped much better in person. So if you can do that in person, it's, it's very valuable. Um, ask, don't assume you know what other people's backgrounds, values, or gifts are you know, ask them and ask them how they might want to contribute to to the work that you're doing. And to go into our working communities with a sense of curiosity and learning and knowing that we don't know everything, um, that, that that community that we're working with has their own brilliance um, to bring to the process. And um, so those were some other uh, things we learned, lessons we learned. I will, um, um, so yeah, so this is, that's been our experience combining an ABC to approach with indigenous cooperative education. Um, we strive to, we strive to stay uh, community driven, adaptable, flexible, and rooted in shared indigenous values and experiences. And we hope that at least some parts of this have resonated with you. And I'm going to pass it back to Krista and um, she'll, she'll, um, take uh, questions.
Thanks. Thank you both, Pamela and Trista as well. Well, Lalio, uh, Trista and Pamela and Carrie Lynn. Um, oh, I learned so much and really hope I get to be a part of the next, uh, the next adventure. Um, so I'm going to ask Carrie Lynn. Oh, never mind. She read my mind. Uh, we'd like to open it up for questions now. If anyone has um, questions or comments that they'd like to share with the panelists, if you could uh, raise your hand, that would be great. Um, I have some questions to get us started. Um, Pamela, could you share, um, you talked about, you talked a little bit about um, some of the challenges at the end there, um, but could you talk a little bit more about the challenges that you face when integrating Indigenous values into a mainstream um, education program? I don't see that as a challenge because we're serving our communities. And so it's a language that we all understand, you know, even if maybe the values are different from the values from where I'm from, I don't see that as a problem because it's, we understand that within each other and we're not trying to train non-Indigenous or non-Native people how to do this approach. We're working with Native people and letting Native people lead. Thank you. I'm just going to check the chat here to see if... Yeah, I see the I see Danielle's question. I'm happy to address it. So Danielle <laughs> asked, you shared that there's no manual. Would you say that there's resources that keep you grounded or that you come back to often? And I would say definitely. Um, what we've really tried to do in this work is take the ABCD tools and and help them resonate with with indigenous uh, values and and worldviews. And so I'll give you an example. One that we always or we use often, the three of us, is the um, head, heart, hands. But we call it head, heart, hands, and spirit because we believe that we need to invite spirit into our work. That is a holistic approach. And we want to value those spiritual gifts that each of us brings. Um, you know, it, whether it's mapping, whether it's body mapping, whether it's, um, yeah, all the all the different kinds of maps we probably have all learned through the ABCD process. Um, we just attempt to make those resonate with our communities. And so that might look different um, for me working with a community. Um, then it looks for Pamela or Trista or Krista working in, in a community. So we, um, my colleague, Brianne, um, she always talked about, you know, there is no manual um, for this process. It's you have to use your own best judgment. And I think that's really what we're tapping into is we're, we're leaning into our own judgment to, to use the gifts in ways that work for the people that we work with. Um, I'll invite Trista or, um, Pamela to jump in if they want. Okay, so my <laughs> uh, my resources. Um, actually, I was still really looking at cooperative development, community development through a westernized or colonized approach. Um, and but my, my job title at the time was Indigenous Relations Lead. And my um, amazing executive director, like this is during lockdown, so I could not go out into the communities. And I'm think, wondering how I'm going to support Indigenous communities when I'm actually not within. within. Uh, so she's the one who recommended um, the Indigenous Women in Leadership and the Building on Abundance courses for me to take to connect. So. The resources that I got from there were those connections with the classmates, with Carrie Lynn and Krista, like, um, and being able to be so fortunate enough to have met Pamela. But working with people or when I'm like continuing this work and I need to get back to my, like, 
why I'm doing this. I think the connections between other strong women working within this space will always bring me back to why I'm doing this, talking to the communities, and that those people connections, I think, are the one of the most critical uh, resources that I, I use. So, Pamela? I like to create lists, and, and I do it because they're like little check boxes and I, I decorate them with some beautiful native designs and art around them. But I do it because sometimes we talk about so many things and when people are looking at, when they're looking at their community, for instance, if they're evaluating the infrastructure or their natural resources, I try to list things out that I know in my community and the communities I work with here. And I do it just so I can spur people's imaginations. It's not like a cast in stone, but it's really for people to just to spur their imagination and look around and go, oh, she forgot to add that. We have that here in our community. Or, oh, I never thought of that. I'm going to check that out. So that's kind of what I do. I, I create tools. And we are going to be using, uh, moving in, into the third and fourth session, we are going to bring in a graphic facilitator to really draw what we're talking about as we're working together uh, as another way, because we're such visual learners. And um, so that's what I love about this. It's so adaptable. So I really am grateful for that. I just want to check in with our participants to see if we have uh, any questions or comments from the group. I was just thinking as you were talking, Pamela, that you and Carrie Lynn must be kindred spirits with your lists. And it's amazing how much we learn from one another. Um, I just wanted to, to jump in on that, that last question, um, talking about resources and and manuals and things. Um, I think it really speaks to the the spirit of ABCD and that it is um, it does look differently in each community. It does look differently um, depending who's facilitating. Um, but the the principles and the values are there um, to guide that work, which I think is so important. Um, I don't see any questions or comments yet, but so I'm going to ask. Unless I just want jump in. <laughs> I just wanted to say before we go that I think the um one of the things I didn't mention in the beginning and I think it's super important is that indigenous communities everywhere in the world um have been building communities in uh, using this ABCD approach and I I think they've learned from indigenous people um so just to recognize that indigenous wisdom that's at the root of all of all of this work um that we've been building communities um based on everybody's gifts for a really long time um and uh to honor that because i think there's many indigenous people that we work with at cody and and that they work with in the world um that also have that wisdom that has been brought to the process so just want to acknowledge that thanks i think we have time for one more uh quick question one moment um maybe if one of you or all of you would like to share briefly on how um education can act as a catalyst in making the indigenous cooperative education successful so i know you touched on it a little bit maybe just to end us off there would be um, a good way to close us out. I'm going to call on one of you, Pamela. <laughs> I was pointing my lips at Carrie, <laughs> Carrie Lynn. <laughs> um, oh gosh, now I got laughing and I forgot what I was going to say. I just feel silly. You know, something that um, we had this woman that's part of our group and we all just adore her. Her name is Bonnie and she's from the second Mesa of the Hopi Nation and she's a first speaker. She's a really beautiful woman that lives 
you know, in alignment with her values and worldviews and her community. And um, I had talked about the mapping and I talked about that transaction map that I learned about in ABCD training. And I thought it was so beautiful, that map. And so she goes, I want to see that. And so I sent it to her and um, she's working with the youth in her community and they're going to do a transaction map of the second Mesa and their community. And that to me is how education, it, it sparks and it, it, it does something with someone's imagination. And I had shared those pictures from the class and she just, you know, that's what I love. And, and if we can keep doing things like that, where our own people can see something and they indigenize, you know, they look at it and it resonates with their spirit and um, they can move that forward and bring those good things to their community. Yeah, I would say the same. And I think you made me think of Bonnie's story, Pamela, you know, Bonnie came to the, to the, the training and was kind of disheartened saying like uh, the the way we work our cooperative is through her family and it's with food um, I think and she said like I it's not it's not legally recognized by the U.S. you know I don't follow the rules of of cooperatives in the U.S. and I said you know what Bonnie any way that you're doing it is the right way because it's in the indigenous way and it's the way that that's working for the people that you're serving and so I think sometimes um the education piece is transformative because it shines a light on what people are doing well and, and acknowledges their um, wisdom and value. And um, so it's not so much about us conveying information as it is us shining a light on what is good and, um, and lifting that up. I'll pass it to Trista. I think the education piece is important because within the communities that we work and the people that we're talking to people talk everybody's related there's relationships everywhere so if we're su um, supporting and providing this education piece um, people are going to grow and learn from examples and people are proud of the accomplishments that they're making and their their initiatives that they're going to share that knowledge with others. Um, one of the most impactful co-ops that I was able to work with was an elders language and cultural co-op to teach the youth and to bring the culture back into the communities. Working and supporting like their co-op development and it really was a little, I always say I didn't really do too much because they already had their structure. They already worked on consensus basis and they already knew their gifts and what they were all bringing to the table. All we had to do was uh, incorporate and legalize and, you know, that was it. But everything else we just took from what they were already doing. And from that example, for being able to do that, we have just incorporated our second elders co-op that are doing these sim uh, a similar thing in a neighboring community because they all wanted community-based and then I was just um, invited to speak on a council of elders from different communities who want to take this initiative and grow it throughout the province so well thank you all again um that was amazing really uh, uplift on my spirits. And I will turn it back over to Wellington. Thank you, Krista. Thanks everyone. It was in a fa fantastic presentation. Uh, I really appreciate it. Well, before we land our plane here, I'd like to invite uh, Carrie Ferguson also to summarize uh, the learnings from the session. Yeah, there was so much there. And uh, just going through my notes really quickly and in the interest of time, I'll just mention a couple of things that I noticed. Um, what Pamela said about always being thrown into philanthropic hunger games and Trista's comment on how you always have to ask. And it reminded me how it creates a culture of learned helplessness, helplessness when you take somebody's ability away to make decisions for themselves. 
right? And and it, either that somebody's making decisions for them or that when they we just don't have the agency to do it for themselves and how ABCD um, works to counteract that. Um, also, your focus on building relationships and trust, that was something that sort of came through in all the sessions, not just yours, but that was a really powerful one and how it feeds into ABCD, but also contributes to it. Um, also, the constant learning and growing experience is something that everybody seemed to mention in all three of the sessions. So that's a big theme. But really importantly, the healing aspect of it, I thought was a, a really huge one and how it builds back communities that have maybe felt helpless for a long time and maybe hasn't, haven't had the agency that they, they needed. So like, the, I guess what I'm saying is the benefits of ABCD are more than just the obvious um, things of empowering and being able to do some things that the, the benefits are far further reaching than that. Um, again, the unintended impacts, everybody mentioned that in all three sessions. Uh, I really like the comment about how people were being confirmed, felt like they were being confirmed as Indigenous people. And I think it, it, it speaks to the empowerment and the confidence building aspects of having being able to make choices and empowering yourselves to, to, to do the things that are important to you. Um, sharing gifts and making the communities a better place to live, I think, is something, too, that is a sort of overarching theme in ABCD. And uh, I also want to, lastly, I just want to mention how it, it intersects, there's so many intersections with uh, feminist practices, particularly of um, evaluation, which is my area, but others too, of empowerment, collaboration, learning, usefulness to participants in the community, community-led capacity building, and hearing the voices of most marginalizing and transformational change. So that's my summary. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you so much. And for us to close, let's take a, um, a screenshot. If you can open up your camera. So turn your camera on so you can take a picture. Perfect. Anyone else? No? Okay, let's do it. One, two, three. One more time, just in case. One, two, three. Well, so thank you all for being part of this inspiring session today. So your passion, insights, and dedication to community development have been truly remarkable. So let's take the energy and ideas from this unconference session and apply uh, them in our communities, nurturing assets and fostering collaboration. So as, as uh, we heard today, I think Brossi was mentioning that um, the journey of ABCD is ongoing, right? And it's in our hands to make our communities even stronger and more vibrant. So stay connected, uh, continue the conversation. Let's turn our vision into action. So we look forward to seeing the incredible work that we result from our time here today. And until next time, go forth and, and be the change. So thank you so much for participating. Thanks, Wellington. Thank you, and see you soon. Thank you.